Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Iggy Molliver. I'm head of product at Remedy, a product studio based in New York uh, that strategizes and builds digital products and invests in early stage tech companies. And I run the Tufts Entrepreneurs Alumni Network, or TEAM. TEAM exists for three reasons. To help entrepreneurs and technologists gain new skills, to help corporate jumbos transition to the startup world, and to support the brilliant students at the Tufts Entrepreneurship Center. In line with our, third, with our third goal, I'm excited to announce that this event series is the first step in TEEN joining the TEC ecosystem in close partnership with the Office of Alumni Relations. This will include enhanced programming, expanded resources, and a meaningful collaboration between alumni and students, all to make a greater impact on the Tufts entrepreneurship community. I'm excited to be moderating today's kickoff program. Tufts entrepreneurs tackle tough questions in venture capital featuring RRE, Director of Platform Laurel Werner, and Menlo VC partner, Matt Murphy. First, I'd like to thank all those who helped make today's program possible. Amy McDonald, Josh Kappelman, Brittany Sokoloff, Shelby Schultz, Kevin Oye, Bill Lavin, Mark Kesslin, Jerry Worznick, our Q&A moderator, Josh Goldman, and of course, our featured speakers. Before I introduce our speakers, you'll notice there's a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen where you can submit your questions. Please utilize this and we'll be asking questions throughout the presentation as well as at the end with some designated time. Laura Werner graduated Tufts with a BA in International Relations and Environmental Studies. After her swimming and water polo career, career at Tufts, Laura dove into the deep end of technology. After three years on the community team at Workbench, she spent a year at AI scheduling software startup X.AI before going back into venture as platform manager at RRE. After her promotion to director last year, congratulations, Laura leads the platform team at one of New York's oldest, largest, and most active firms. With investments in Business Insider, Venmo, BuzzFeed, Datadog, and a whole bunch of other companies. Laura supports a portfolio of 150 companies across 26 states for a firm that boasts 60 exits. Thank you for joining us, Laurel. Our second feature panelist is Matt Murphy. Matt holds a bachelor's in electrical engineering from Tufts and an MBA from someplace called Stanford. Matt was a product manager at Sun Microsystems before becoming director of business development and product management at NetBoost. After Intel's acquisition, Matt joined Kleiner Perkins, one of Silicon Valley's premier venture capital firms. Over 15 years there, Matt led investments in Shazam, AppDynamics, and Session M, among others. In 2015, Matt became managing director at, at Menlo Ventures, where he has continued to pick winners like Rain Man at the blackjack table. So thank you, Matt and Laurel, for joining us uh, and for giving us your time today. So to, to kick us off, um, I'd love to hear from both of you about uh, your day-to-day -day role and how it has changed in light of COVID. All right, Laurel, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Well, I'll take it. Um, yeah, so my day-to-day -day role is actually fairly varied. Um, but if I think about my overarching goal, it's to help accelerate our 150 portfolio companies. So, you know, with that many companies, it was really valuable for us to find some sort of programmatic way of interacting with them. And so I think of myself as helping them solve the challenges that other startups have encountered before. They have their investing team member or they have their, their board and their management team to help them figure out something like, should they go to market serving SMBs or serving consumers, something really specific to the company. But if all they're trying to figure out is how they should do structured hiring, that's a thing that lots of companies have encountered before. It's something that I can source answers to from our networks. And that's really the, what we call the platform function. So as you can imagine, that takes a lot of different flavors. Um, we, we do a lot of sort of reactive solving of company problems, uh, but we also build more proactive programs uh, in stuff like business development where we're like leveraging our Fortune 500 connections or um, we've done a lot of leadership development with our companies because we think that's really important. Um, just a, generally a lot of peer learning um, and network connection uh, is what falls under my role. And as you can imagine, that's pretty different uh, in the day-to-day, -day. in COVID times, the 
the work is not that different, but the topics have really changed in terms of what people are interested in and trying to get information about. So that's me. Um, really excited, honestly, to be here with Matt, uh, who's an enterprise tech OG. Uh, <laughs> you know, I started off at Workbench Ventures. I'm enterprise all day, every day. So uh, you guys have someone, someone special here to, to learn from. Well, you'll be happy to know I just led an investment with Workbench that hasn't been announced yet, but I'm really excited about that. Um, All right. Yeah. Well, uh, so I'm, I'm in my 20th year of venture capital, which is uh, kind of exciting. 21st, actually, because um, this is the third, whatever this is, the third kind of um, downturn disruption shock to the system that I've kind of been through. And, and um, I think we're all still trying to calibrate what this one really is. So if you look at like the last three to four years in venture capital, it's been a pure kind of momentum environment. Companies don't, don't go out and raise. It's everything's been preempted. And the majority of people's time has really been out scrambling to uh, win that next great investment. And you know, the, out, the, the nature of the business has changed so much to outbound versus when I started 20 years ago when it was a smaller industry and a lot of stuff would come inbound. Now everyone has to hustle. Even if you've got a longstanding reputation in the business, things aren't going to come to you anymore. You have to be out there. So I'd say the biggest change in my job in the middle of COVID is we've gone from kind of 80% seemingly sourcing to like 10%. So the whole job's kind of inverted. And frankly, it's the way I grew up in the business, so I don't mind it so much. Uh, except that the, let's see, this is week nine of work from home. And the first seven weeks were all about playing defense. And I think the thing that we all love in venture is helping our companies play offense. And Laurel mentioned her kind of platform responsibilities and what they do for portfolio companies. And we have something similar for our firm called Fuel, and it has four pillars. It's a talent partner, uh, a uh, business development partner, a, a marketing partner, and then network development partner. So we apply a ton of resource to the portfolio and spend all our time trying to figure out how to, uh, you know, the reason why we call it fuel, it's like the fuel that gets them off the ground, gets them on that trajectory faster. So love that part of the job, figuring out the, how to get the next executive or the next big deal that the company um, could win that could really change their trajectory. The last seven weeks was all about um, multiple iterations of reductions, uh, changing the plan, figuring out uh, whether they were gonna get some debt they thought they were gonna get, maybe putting some new debt in place, maybe a little bit of an equity infusion. So it was all about trying to get companies to last 24 months, or if they were really in trouble, trying to figure out how to get them to last uh, 12 months. So I'd say on average, the companies I work with cut anywhere between 10 to 33%. Uh, you know, which is pretty traumatic. I mean, these companies have all spent so much time chasing this amazing talent and then have to let that many of them go that quickly, kind of out of the blue, has been a big adjustment for everybody. What I would say is um, most companies are through, all companies are through Q1 now, whether you had a 331 or a 430 QN. I think all the companies were putting in plans leading up to that point in time. Those are in place. Whether companies have cut enough or not remains to be seen, but at least there's kind of a new operating plan in place that we're all moving forward on. So now we're kind of getting back to a little bit more normalcy on the play offense with the companies. I would say the sourcing is still dramatically down. I think you know, we'll get to this, I'm sure, in some questions down the road, but, I, but it's still really like making sure that you're helping companies. And it's hard right now if you haven't been, um, if you haven't had a longstanding relationship with an entrepreneur to uh, meet someone like this and uh, end up making an investment. So I think a lot of people are kind of slowly kicking tires, getting to know people again and building pipeline of new investments for the second half of the year. So I'll pause at that. You both alluded to how you're supporting uh, existing companies, how you're trying to get them to spread out resources further, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Obviously there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of flux about the funding environment. Um, Laurel, from your end, from the platform end, what are you doing to support portfolio companies in this difficult time and, and what areas are you focused on? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, like I said, a lot of the same kind of type of work that I normally do, which is find the experts, aggregate resources and share them back out to our companies. Um, especially from within our portfolio. A lot of times there are people who know the answer to whatever question you have already within the RRE networks that we can help bridge, bridge that gap. Um, the topics are pretty universal, I would say. 
Um, CARES Act funds, I'm sure none of us want to hear the words PPP after this ever again. Um, resources around mental health um, and like dealing with that for your teams and, um, you know, managing how all of these like cash, cash reductions and um, layoffs and stuff like that are affecting your team's, you know, culture at the moment. Um, stuff on the shift to remote work, how to manage through that, shift your types of communication. Um, and yeah, just figuring out how to extend runway, I think is like, like Matt said, a huge piece of this. Um, the actual like mechanisms for doing that kind of vary. So um, one of the things that we've seen work well is just getting people on a call with an expert, um, like a lawyer to ask their questions or you know, find, getting that lawyer in place for them. Um, there are really lots of different angles that people are taking on this and there's so much stuff to be done um, that there's a lot, a lot of different stuff happening. I think that the, the things that are effective in my mind are like crowdsourcing. So I'm also the um, president of the VC platform community, which is like all the people globally who are in this role. Um, and really there's a lot of just like, getting in information sharing about like how much is your landlord reducing your rent like how much can i ask for for my landlord um what price are you getting on that lawyer um do you have any talent that you can you know share with those people um so there's a lot of a lot of good work happening for sure um and then the, the actual distribution is sometimes like webinars or you know, Google Docs even. Uh, there's a lot of hacking stuff together happening right now. Yeah, it sounds like we're doing a lot of the same things. I mean, I would say that, you know, we've shifted the the work at the kind of help the company's level from a lot of the offensive stuff to more the things Laura was talking about. So, you know, if you do layoffs, how do you come up with a list that you're sharing with other portfolio companies around people who've been laid off if somebody else is hiring and kind of directing those? Laura also mentioned PPP, which was this big, storm within the industry should you take it do you qualify should you give it back and so there's just been a lot of communication with the portfolios and helping them to make a better decision on things like that or even best practices in, in laying people off and really trying to connect them i think the more you know this whole platform nature of vcs has really grown up in the last five years where many or most firms have some kind of a platform capability and, it, and, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of table stakes, but it can also be a real differentiator for a firm if you do it well. Um, and so I think all of us are trying to figure out how we can bring together portfolio companies, add more value beyond just an individual partner, an individual talent partner, or business development partner in a firm, but how can we get all the other companies helping each other? And I think that connectivity right now has been more important than ever is everybody's kind of looking for answers around how are you handling this? How did that work and go? Yeah, and I'm also seeing a lot of good work around not necessarily duplicating what other firms are doing, but working together to kind of crowds um, or like work, uh, you know, find ways to, to be doing similar work, whether that's like sharing talent lists or like you mentioned, just all that kind of stuff that people are concerned about. Um, there's a lot of nice partnerships coming out of this I'm seeing. Yeah, you know, I mean, other things though, um... You know, if you, if you needed a VP of sales before, likely you still need a VP of sales. So all those kind of activities are still going on. Maybe some of them got a little bit delayed as the company was working through its kind of, you know, revised plan and so forth. But that's what I was saying earlier is I do feel like we've gotten back to this kind of playing more offense on the building out the rest of the executive teams, probably more important than now ever. Some decisions that, you know, you might have just been delaying because times were easier. Everything's harder now. So you need to make sure you have the right people uh, in the right seats. I'd say, you know, one of the things that's gotten really big over the last few years is people have, you know, EBC. So it's essentially a nice word for uh, customer meetings. You hold a set of customer meetings. You'll know, take the CIO of P&G and put together a day with your portfolio companies. And those things have been super effective for portfolio companies to get prioritized access to the right people. Those things are obviously very hard to pull off right now. We're doing about two a week and we've started to move some of them, you know, virtually, but it probably doesn't have the same impact as having somebody there. And I think that's part of this new adjustment of working 
virtually, just like enterprise sales is not going to be effective, but maybe it gets more effective as everyone gets more comfortable with this new way of doing things. Um, so we'll definitely see some, some changes out of this stick, but I think some things will also go back to the previous norm. Uh, I wanted to jump in because you both alluded to uh, helping companies conserve cash and be smart about stretching out their runway. And I suspect that the reason is because of what your outlook is on the funding and investment climate uh, in the near and midterm. Um, could you share with us a bit about uh, how you're, you're viewing uh, the funding climate, let's say from now through the end of the year and then in 2021? Yeah. Um, I, I take this one first. Um, you know, well, generally what companies have done, if I said on average, you know, a SaaS company um, has adjusted their plan down to like 50% in Q2 and then to what it's original and then maybe 30, 70% of its original plan uh, in Q3 and Q4. Um, so, you know, whether that's right or not yet, um, you know, we, we don't know. Um, but I think that, um, you know, kind of getting companies to their, to their new normal uh, and then you have to see what happens. So the, what that has to do with the, the funding climate is nobody wants to go in as a new investor, invest in a company when they don't have confidence in their plan. So now everyone's kind of, you know, shed their, uh, shed their winter weight, but now we have to see how they, they perform. And uh, I think there's companies that are kind of thrown into potentially needing to raise a financing and your best bet there is probably, you know, some kind of bridge from your insiders. I think, you know, the companies that you're seeing raise money now, like, a, you know, like a Notion or a Figma, you know, there's a set of like beachfront property out there, top five, 10 companies that everybody's been swarming around that maybe are, you know, protected from this environment, maybe doing just as well as they were before, or people are just using it as an opportunity to get into those companies. And so, those are really the outliers, but I think your mainstream company right now, who wants to raise money in the middle of this? Because you know every investor is probably looking for a deal. Um, and at the same time, you can't even stand up to that investor and say, I have 90% confidence in this plan because you just don't know. So the short thing is everybody's gone through this adjustment phase to kind of get their house in order and figure out how long they can last and push a fundraise into next year and you know why next year well because you hope it's better than this year um but nobody you know nobody knows right now but uh you know we know that q2 for really every almost every company is looking really bad until things start to hopefully rebound a bit so you're just trying to buy yourself to, to some time until we get back to some normalcy uh laurel do you have any kind of uh, obviously sitting from the platform side, do you have advice for companies that are already in your portfolio that are thinking about, you know, where they have to stretch things out to and, uh, you know, when folks are coming to you, how they should think about their resource allocation because of that? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's, they just, it's so specific to the company. It's hard to say like what, what overall, but like just cutting your burn however you can is going to make a difference. Um, a lot of people are trying to figure out like um, interesting partnerships that they can do during these times. Um, there's a lot of like, like uh, Matt said, just figuring out like what their plan should even look like and how bad these losses are going to be um, and how much they do need to cut. Um, but it's, it's tough to say without like looking at the actual company. I think you probably want to model out a couple different scenarios um, and look at where the real existing revenue is coming from um, and what you can kind of live without for a little while um, and what you can potentially lose. Um, I think we touched a little bit on like how enterprise sales is going. Like there are so many, all, all of these big companies are reprioritizing their technology buying um, and a lot of times they don't really know what they need yet even. Um, so people like sales staff can be easy to cut in a situation like that, um, but really have seen a lot of sort of proactive uh, headcount cuts across the board at companies that just don't know where they're gonna be in three or six months. Um, Cause that's generally a big, big source of cost for a startup, right? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 
if you don't mind, can I can I jump in with a, a question? Go ahead, John. Um, yeah, I was curious for Matt and Laurel. Um, you know, look, all of us who are investors are dealing a lot right now with with our portfolio companies whose revenue, whose business is is being slashed, um, and it's a fraction of what was expected or what it was a couple of months ago. Um, I and I'm sure you guys have a couple of companies who are unexpectedly um, in a very good position or actually benefiting from what's happening right now. I wonder if each of you might be able to discuss one or two that is in your portfolio that is kind of a surprising beneficiary of the new way we're living and working in this, in this environment. Yeah, I mean, I think RRE has actually been super fortunate in this regard, and it's not something that I generally like to talk about too publicly because, of course, we have this horrifying pandemic going on. Um, but our portfolio is super diversified across a ton of industries. Um, almost all of our companies have seen either a neutral or positive effect from this. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting because in, in venture capital, you see a lot of firms that have a very specific thesis. Um, you see sort of more generalist firms. Um, and, you know, this, this can sometimes come back to bite you if your entire thesis is, you know, the future of retail and that's the only thing you're invested in. Um, you have to kind of see how that shakes out uh, in a year or so. Um, but yeah, a couple of our companies that are doing well. Um, you can imagine Olo, which is an online delivery service, um, has had record-breaking growth. One that's actually really interesting, which I wouldn't have expected, is a company called Bark. Um, they sell subscription boxes for dogs, have just launched dog food. They ha have a whole huge pet line, um, kind of the a competitor like Chewy or something like that. And people are spending all this time at home with their dogs. Their numbers have just been astronomical um, for something that you wouldn't really tie into a pandemic, but it's that's something that's uh, really seen some breakout growth. Yeah. We, we actually have some other interesting ones too, but I'll save those for the, the post webinar. No, Josh, I think one of the things that companies are trying to figure out right now is, are they above or below the line? And that line is really like, uh, am I essential or am I nice to have in this environment? And I'm sure every entrepreneur wants to think and believe that they're above that line. And right now, I think everyone's going to figure that out in Q2 because Q1, I think relative to what was going on, was disproportionately good for most companies because they were late enough in the pipeline. They had a big pipeline. CFOs weren't slashing quite as aggressively yet. I think Q2 is going to be the real um, reckoning. But where I'd kind of say that line is in, let's say, SaaS is, you know, are you, are you something that, um, you know, that helps with uh, automation, uh, with people working remotely? And it doesn't mean like you're a remote working solution. It just means like, are you, um, you know, something like in, in DevOps, for example, when you've got fewer people on site to even solve problems. So can you are you doing some things that automate uh, software uptime, software reliability, you know, things like that. I think when, um, when you get a much more dispersed workforce become more important, really any kind of uh, automation uh, in the organization. But I'll, I'll just bring up one kind of surprise outlier is a company called, um, called Hover. And what they do is they use, um, you take six iPhone pictures, create a 3D model of your home and the, and the, the 3D model is more precise than the way that most things are done today with a contractor or an insurance adjuster. You get up on the side of the building, you measure it with a tape measure, but it takes a long time to change an industry like construction. Well, what happens when people don't want somebody coming up to their house and breathing on their windows or you know getting up on ladders? So suddenly this business that was primarily driven by contractors uh, has now had um, more than half their business uh, move to um, the insurance adjuster industry. And that's something that you kind of look at and say, some things are going to post back to post, you know, uh, post COVID. Like for example, Rover right now, which is about dog walking is way down because people are home and they're walking their dogs. They're not kind of outsourcing that. So, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll come back, but things like hover when a change happens, when you move a, a workflow from analog, somebody getting up on a ladder with a tape measure to suddenly everyone being trained because of this to stay further from the house, take the 3D, use the 3D model, uh, that changes forever. Why would anybody after that say, I, I'm gonna go back and do the ladder thing? Uh, so I think we're really gonna see some acceleration in some, I don't know if they're, they're just, 
uh, a number of workflows that are going to accelerate to digital in a way they wouldn't have um, before. Great, thank you guys. Thank, thanks both of you. I see a related question coming in. This is from Warren Hilton. Uh, Warren's asking, in downturns, many new companies get started. It's early, but are you seeing a similar effect this time around? How is early stage angel and seed space doing? Either of you have thoughts on, you know, are you seeing new companies emerge already to take advantage of this environment we're in right now? I mean, I mean this is my first down, sorry, downturn of this scale. So Matt's really going to be the expert here. Um, but if you think about all of, you know, these layoffs and recessions, like people have the space to take risks and time to spend building stuff that they might not otherwise have taken is the short answer. Um, in terms of what that means for investing, that's a little bit more complicated. Um, and I, at least I have personally, haven't seen many people really jumping into the breach yet um, to say like, oh, I got laid off from Google. I'm now going to found something else. Um, but it may be that angels are seeing more of that kind of activity. And Matt, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I so, Laurel, you know, Laurel just called you an old guy. Uh, I, know that I can handle that. I heard um, it and I didn't mean to, but you know what? It's just, well, just Matt and I have both, Matt and I have uh, both lived through a few downturns, but Matt, go ahead. And, uh, yeah. and yeah, I mean, are you seeing so any on, new companies? Yeah, I mean, I'm on the board of Carter, right? So company fat formations are clearly down. So it's not like, you know, you're seeing, oh, well, there's more startups being started because like it's harder right now. I mean, seed funds have a bunch of uh, companies that they need, that they're now panicked about that need to raise their A. Um, everybody's trying to figure out like what is the new norm here so everybody's bar goes up at every stage of you know the investment cycle so what I you don't you certainly don't see it from a volume level but that's okay in fact that's 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 oftentimes better I think like you know what what you generally seen in, in downturns like this is that people start in it in, in, in an environment where it's harder to succeed harder to win harder to get funded and all of those things lead to a kind of, you know, a fitter animal that's ready for any kind of environment versus one that just gets a little bit lax when things are easier. You know, your idea needs to be better. Your execution needs to be better. And I think that's the kind of narrative you'll hear around an environment like this that I agree with. Great. Um, I see another question. I think it's interesting. David Strauss is asking in what specific, maybe this is best for Laurel to start, but Matt, feel free also. In what specific ways are you connecting your portfolio companies during this time? So founders and other functional leaders can talk to each other and share best practices. Are you connecting them by sector, stage, or location? Yeah, so the primary ways, oh, sorry about the sirens. And it's also, it's gonna be seven o'clock in one minute here and it's gonna get loud. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the actual tactical ways, um, are like webinar style stuff where we can get a panel of experts and just have people ask questions, um, calls, um, honestly, like one-on-one -on -one email introductions to let people know, oh, you're doing the same thing. Um, in the, in pre-COVID times, we get people together by, by function. So basically, you know, marketing leaders, um, or finance leaders will bring in, you know, the chief product officer of some, some place like Oscar Health and have her talk to the product leaders in our portfolio. Um, so similar types of work happening now, but just have to be more digital. Um, and yeah, I'm trying to think of their, those are the, mostly the, the actual tactics of how we're networking people together right now. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I think we're all trying to just get that connectivity yeah. main. So, I mean, some people have actually built a, you know, a, a platform like First Round has. You know, I think a lot of it is done through email, and then we have kind of a, a portal that that, uh, that augments that. Yeah, Google Groups is the other big one that we use yeah. with our portfolio company. So, you know, if you're an HR leader, you can just shoot out your question to the other HR leaders in the portfolio. So... Nothing groundbreaking in terms of tools, but just uh, giving people a space to, to find each other. Yeah. I think one thing that was touched on and, and that I'd love to hear about before we go to more uh, audience Q&A 
is that this is a time that just naturally is full of anxiety and instability for many people. The lines between work and home life are very blurred. A lot of people are working longer hours, but also caring for children, uh, parents, uh, for, for people who are sick. What are you doing to manage your mental health at work and how are you helping your, your founders and your teams manage theirs? Yeah, well, um, so my new part of my routine that I never did before was uh, I, I found myself the first four weeks, you know, immediately start the morning coffee by the computer, Zooms all day, and it was maddening. Um, and got kind of tired of Zoom very quickly. And every call, as you know, has become a Zoom call. For some reason, now we have to have video on everything. So I'm trying to pull back from that a little bit. But the main thing I've added to my routine is I wake up every morning and I go out for an hour walk while I take my first set of calls so that I've been outside and uh, sometimes just not be on the phone. And that's when I think you get a lot of like clarifying thoughts, good time to think. And um, there was a good article in the Wall Street Journal if you just look about something like why is walking good for you? It's like very uh, primal uh, as we're like the only species that walks around standing up all the time. So. I recommend reading it and why um, you get so many creative synapses firing when you're, uh, when you're walking. So that's kind of my new part of my personal routine for mental health. I love it. One of the most frustrating parts of being in quarantine in a very dense neighborhood is that it doesn't really feel, it feels risky to be going for a walk. Um, and so tactics like that and a lot of my usual day-to-day -day tactics for like managing my own mental health have kind of gone out the window um, I don't know if it helps, but I, everyone is experiencing the same thing. And when I get on calls with founders and I'm like, hey, you're paying attention to your team's mental health and giving them these resources, what are you doing for you? A lot of them are like, mm, not that much. Um, and so it's definitely tough, tough for everyone out there. Um, I think there, the more you can take advantage of this kind of natural slowdown and you're doing less travel and spending more time with your family, um, if you can find ways to take advantage of that, that's great. Um, but I'm not necessarily the best person to, to say I've been, I've been doing those things. I'd say the other thing I've done is just, you know, more impromptu calls to my, you know, partners to kind of catch up, just, hey, what's going on? You know, when you're in the office, there's enough serendipitous moments that you feel that's covered. When you don't see them, you feel like everybody's busy. Um, but just kind of polling and checking in on various partners. What are you working on? Can I help? Anything you're thinking about? Um, and I think that's been a, a good temporary way to bond, but certainly no replacement for face-to-face -face in my mind. Yeah, so is, I've seen a lot of, I was just going to say one thing, like if you, I've seen a lot of companies do interesting stuff depending on what's relevant for them and their team culture. So, you know, some, some, companies are really thriving here. Um, we have a company called Pattern, which is uh, very invested in helping people enjoy their daily lives. And they live that with their team culture. So they're doing stuff like cooking and painting together as a team or like putting together a collaborative playlist, which obviously that's not going to translate for, for everyone. Um, but I think stuff like that and maybe designating someone who's kind of in charge of checking up on, on your team is really helpful. So Laurel, Matt, you, you, Laurel, you kind of started with this part, so I'll, I'll maybe continue into this, but uh, are you seeing any kind of really unique ways that companies are bonding and, and building uh, a good environment for their, for their coworkers, for their employees uh, outside of the usual Zoom happy hour? And this relates to actually a question that Ricardo Roberts submitted. Uh, how do you reassure your portfolio companies who may not have experienced the downturn prior to this one and who are struggling with it? I, so I haven't seen anybody doing anything particularly um, novel. Maybe Laurel has a let her comment on that one. In terms of the company stuff, like, you know, I think it's more been that first seven weeks I described, like get your house in order. You know, um, we were all trying to grow as fast as possible. And, and, you know, now it's more about like, you know, you really need to have a pulse on like how ready your market is, how efficient uh, your sales org is. Um, and if you do those things, you're going to get through it. You know, what, what, what you don't want to do is run out of money without having proven something significant. I'd say there's a very small percentage of companies, like sub 10% in our portfolio where, you know, they just don't have time, meaning like there's a six or nine month window of capital. If you've got longer than that, then think about all the things you need to do to 
to get to the next round, to prove you have a, a strong business. And I think if you can align around those goals and, those, and that North Star, then, uh, then that's motivating. So uh, thank you. I, I think we have a few other interesting questions and uh, I'll maybe uh, take one here and then Josh Goldman, if you want to take over, I think it'd be a great time to jump into Q&A. Um, so uh, this, is, this relates to something that uh, Matt, you spoke about this kind of the companies that emerged from, from this time period have kind of gone through a trial by fire almost because of how difficult the, the climate is. Uh, Jake Lombardo asks, do startups that make it through a downturn like this automatically have stronger confidence level for future investments? Uh, or does the playing field level out again when, when you do return to normalcy? Hmm. Uh, that's a nuanced question because I think just every, every company is a snowflake. So a lot of it, I mean, depends on you know, the market you're serving. Like did, did the market that you're serving, did it come out you know, ready to take off again, or is it, you know, more permanently impaired or a slower, you know, ramp back. So I'm not saying just because a company was one of the most progressive in making cuts or something that they come out of it, you know, like a, a you know, a, a winner relative to a company that just had, you know, an, an awesome market or something like that. So it's, it's, it's a blend of things, but, you know, the, the main thing that you can do as an entrepreneur is just give yourself the optionality to give yourself time to prove what you need to prove. I mean, you know, even COVID aside, there's plenty of companies that struggle for three, five years, and then all something, all of a sudden something clicks. And, uh, you know, it's getting to that moment that it clicks, that to click and giving yourself the time and hopefully having the right investors to believe in you and back you along the way um, are the important things. Great, I'll jump in. We're getting some other audience questions. Um, uh, these came in earlier from Daniel Rubenstein. He submitted a list of questions, but let me, uh, let me pick one. Um, he started by asking, how are VC funds positioning themselves in the current environment? Are you currently looking at new investments or keeping powder dry to support existing portfolio companies? To the extent you're looking at any new investments, have the investment criteria or sector focus changed based on the pandemic? Yeah, so I think um, uh, in terms of venture funds, you know, depending upon where you are in a fund cycle, you, know, you, you might just you know, bump up reserves by 20%. If you've got a four or $500 million fund and you're only $100 million invested, it doesn't really you know, change things from that perspective. You know, if, you've got a, if you've got a fund that's fully invested and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, we were planning on all these follow-on reserves being X and now they're two or three X, then you do need to kind of scramble a bit and yeah. maybe be a little bit Darwinian about you know, who gets capital and things like that. Um, or just kind of metering capital into some companies. You can't just peanut butter around anywhere. But the reality is you shouldn't be doing that anyway. Um, in terms of looking at new investments, uh, I would say the things that are getting done now, I mentioned a little bit up front, is where a venture firm has known an entrepreneur for a long period of time. And, and just now is the moment to kind of move forward with that. Um, the things that are hardest right now are the net new company, new entrepreneur that you haven't met and somebody makes an introduction. And you know, the way things have been moving over the last three years, it's kind of like from introduction to a term sheet you know, is oftentimes less than 30 days. That's like really compressed. Nobody's going to, nobody that I know is going to do that over Zoom. So, you know, you're kind of saying, all right, like we're going to do this slower. And by the way, you've already got a bunch of problems in your portfolio. Like why invest in another company that might be in, in, in trouble in six months, even if they're well capitalized, you know, you don't know the way we're going to get out the other side of this. So I think the things that, that people are really looking for right now are twofold. One, capital efficiency and two more than anything, um, a company that is benefiting um, or at least neutral in this environment. Laura, yeah, a hundred percent on everything that Matt is saying. That's exactly what we're seeing too. Um, when we talk about all that new inbound, a lot of it is conversations that are picking back up because in this crisis, people are just looking to, to raise how they can and where they can. Um, of people that we've already met. And yeah, like you said, capital efficiency, 
some sort of line of sight to profitability or at least like multiple years of sustained growth. Um, and then, yeah, just a business model that works both in and out of COVID, right? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting. And I, I back that up also. I, I have always had a rule with my companies, even before all this, that I personally don't invest as, a, as an angel investor in a company unless there's a believable model that shows 18 months of runway when the current round gets done. And personally, I've extended that now to 24. Um, yeah. If I can't see, and, and as an angel, I'm usually not a lead, um, but if the round is coming together and I don't see now 24 months of runway, and not always on management's projections, but on my own kind of bottoms up model that I build, um, I usually will back out or essentially will always back out. Um, if it's less than 18 in the, the old environment, now 24. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, to Matt's point about kind of conserving cash and, and making sure there's enough dry powder, uh, that's kind of a rule I've been following in the last couple of months. Um, another interesting question, this one is uh, Robert Williams is asking, how do your firms balance sharing lessons and practices with, I think he means among venture firms, with keeping your firm's proprietary posture? Is there really more sharing going on? Sorry, I've got a dog back in the, barking in the background. Hold on a second, go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's plenty of stuff that we do that's proprietary and stuff that doesn't need to be. So um, if I think about something like a list of good vendors, like that's something that anyone with kind of like a, a decent brain can come up with and spend time on. Um, I don't feel like I need to go find, um, you know, extra people if there's someone else in the ecosystem that I can share that with or that can share it with me. Um, I think the stuff that we build that is more, I guess, proprietary is stuff that we actually spend time building. So like for our leadership development program, we developed all of the content and made it really startup specific and like figured out the ways that the program was going to work and be successful. Um, and that's something that I'm happy to sh kind of share the details on, but I know that it's a lot of work to actually build. And so it's something that um, I feel is, you know, differentiated for RRE right now. Mm -hmm. um, but for, for a lot of other stuff, it's just trading notes on um, like, did you, did, did you uh, like working with this HR lawyer to like help you do your layoffs um, mm -hmm. is something that I feel like is only going to benefit everyone. Um, and at least in, in New York, I feel like the, the platform teams and the venture funds are still in a, in a fairly collaborative mindset. I think that's, that's changing somewhat, um, but that, that tends to be the kind of overall tenor of the city anyway, is to, to share knowledge and information. Yeah, you know, one of the things we've been doing that's new, this is more, you know, inside the firm, but it touches somewhat on your point, is... Um, you know, we, we kind of have an hour to start off the, the Monday partners meeting now where we kind of go around the horn through each portfolio company. And you generally don't do that. You don't need to talk about every portfolio company every week. But in this environment, things are so fluid. You're like, what, what are they seeing? You know, whether it's how do they handle PPP, their layoff, their, their new plan, what, you know, how is the forecast looking, how their quarter end. So we're going around the horn every, every week with the whole portfolio and kind of marching you through it. Um, quickly and through that we're sharing a lot of real-time lessons about what people are seeing and and uh, that can lead to other conversation after the fact around like you know well who should I let me talk to this partner about this issue because they just went through this and th things like that I'd say as part of that you know we're also a little bit like everybody's anecdotally talking to their peers in the industry and it's kind of like hey what are you seeing others doing from a new investment standpoint and things like that to make everyone's curious to hear how everyone else is you know, behaving so fairly open, I would say. Yeah, I, you know, I was a partner for 12 years at a major venture firm at Norwest Venture Partners. Um, and I think what a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize is that, you know, they see kind of VCs competing with each other for new deals. And of course that happens. But more of our time is, is spent on growing our current portfolio of companies and in most cases, virtually every case I've ever invested in a company, there are multiple VCs and you are in the trenches together helping your company. So there's 
a ton of cooperation. Most of the time is around cooperating with your peers in the industry to help your current companies in which you're both on the board or you, you're both invested in the companies. So I think that that isn't always known or, or recognized by new entrepreneurs or people thinking about getting into this, that VCs both cooperate, but actually more often than not are, um, I'm sorry, they compete, but more often than not, they're actually cooperating on helping their companies. For sure. Uh, let me just take a quick look, more, com more questions coming in. Um, Uh, here's a good one. Let me go to this one. Alexander Wolkin is asking, how should founders think about building relationships with investors now, even if their time horizon for an investment might be going into 2021? Well, I think what we all like, and even in, even in a kind of crazy environment like it's been the last few years, like most people are getting to know companies a year in advance or a year and a half in advance so that they can preempt. So I think the easier part of this environment is getting to know VCs via Zoom and kind of telling them about your business, getting them interested and excited to spend time with you on an ongoing basis. Because it's not like you meet that person once and it's like, oh, you're raising around a year later, let me show up. Then you probably didn't really build a relationship. But if you're kind of checking in along the way, figuring out how you can help them on various things, uh, you know, that's the way you build a relationship. So I think it's a good point, a good starting point now to start that conversation and then, you know, check in again with that VC in three months, tell them the goals and progress, you know, that you've made and then continue to do that as you, you know, approach 2021. Great. Um, let me go to Stephanie Marks's question. Everything is online now and CCPA is still a big issue. I assume this is California Consumer Protection Act. How are your companies preparing for CCPA requirements, which will be immediately enforced starting in July? And are there any companies that we should look out for in this space? Any thoughts on that, Laurel or Matt? CCPA is the equivalent of GDPR, right? That's, I, I haven't stayed that close to it, unfortunately. Okay. I don't have any good intel here. Matt? Not really. I mean, I, I hear a lot of companies spending more time right now on, um, you know, compliance stuff. I think, uh, you know, in a, in a world that gets a little bit more um, constrained, let's say, things, things get a little harder, it gets harder to get a deal done, or you have priorities around like, hey, we need to have our internal controls even better now that we're you know, more remote and things like that. I think compliance does um, move up the stack in terms of priorities. So there are a number of companies that are working on things there that, that we're looking at. We think that's an interesting thesis area, but I can't really speak specifically to what our companies are doing around that specific issue. Okay, a question at from Alan Olson. Sounds like most of current startups are providing services. Have hardware startups cratered? What's the environment like for hardware startups in your portfolio today, either of you? Well, I mean, hardware was kind of dead for 10 years and then came back in the form of, you know, consumer hardware, Fitbit, Peloton, Total, um, uh, drop cam, all that kind of stuff. So I think there's been really a nice renaissance of um, consumer hardware, uh, but it's not the kind of hardware that used to dominate the VC business like uh, Juniper routers and Cisco switches and that kind of big heavy hardware and all the you know chips and technology behind that that was you know, probably at some point in time back in the in the 90s, like half of all venture investment. Now those kind of things are you know, less than 10%. And even a lot of the storage companies have obviously moved to you know, cloud storage and things like that. Or they've got some maybe on-prem version, but they're really moving to the cloud. So I, I wouldn't say that, I would just say that that progression you know, continues uh, on the infrastructure side, but I do think that there's more appetite and interest in consumer hardware than you know, in the last five years and going forward than there was in the previous 15. Yeah, it's a little bit more about like the actual hardware and capital efficiency than whether it's hardware versus software. Um, I mean, 
I think there are sectors like robotics that are helping accelerate automation that are going to do really well coming out of this. Um, but it is true that more moonshotty type of hardware that takes a ton of capital to get to profitability, I think is going to have a harder time raising funding in this environment. Yeah, robotics is a key one. I lost my train of thought on that, but, but yeah, robotics is, I mean, we know so many of the jobs that are done today by humans that humans don't yeah. are going to be totally. done by, by robots. So, you know, that's still a, an, an interesting area. But capital intensity there is still an issue for a lot of hardware companies. Yeah, the question may, uh, and this is just speculation, it may be around whether the COVID environment is affecting supply chains now for hardware companies going forward. If you've been waiting for prototypes and, you know, validation um, uh, engineering exercises coming through from China or you have component mm -hmm. parts, are those being affected? You know, my own experience is they were a couple of months ago and a lot of that is getting closer to normal now back in in China, uh, it's probably not at 100% of where it was three months ago. Um, but look, a lot of small companies who are dealing with um, engineering resources from China or waiting for parts from China, they're getting put behind larger companies whose supply chains have been disrupted. So that may have an impact for, for several months. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think all of our companies doing physical product have seen supply chain disruption in some way or another, whether it's coming from China or not. Um, yeah, you're not you're not wrong that they sometimes get beh put behind bigger businesses, but I have seen people really effectively like reroute their chains and uh, renegotiate contracts to to really come out of this uh, actually sometimes better than they went in. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Alberto Rivera. Uh, Alberto is asking, um, Matt, this is about the um, conversation that's uh, the discussion around founders engaging in discussions with investors. He's asking, uh, do you have suggestions on the method of starting those conversations between entrepreneurs and reaching out to venture capitalists? I don't think that part's really changed. I mean, you know, venture capitalists, have a network of people that they believe in, trust, rely on. Um, and if it comes from somebody like that, that's kind of the express lane, you know, something over the top that just kind of gets lobbed in, you know, really hard, you know, to get somebody's attention. Somebody might immediately look at your, look at your LinkedIn background and be like, okay, if this person was a star before, then I'll talk to them. But if they're kind of an unknown, yeah, I just don't have the, you know, the time. So I, my, my advice there is to basically, you know, it's kind of what, what the angel and seed ecosystem has done is, you know, help uh, fledgling entrepreneurs, um, A, be able to prove a bit, but B, develop a, a network that they otherwise wouldn't have to be able to get in front of those venture capitalists at the right time. I don't say that to be discouraging. I'm just being like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an industry where you're bombarded with people and ideas all the time. And so, you know, you try to, you know, you call that down to ones that have higher signal. Yeah. Laurel, anything to I think that's, all, yeah, that's all fair to say. I mean, yeah, it's just so much information all the time um, that I think, you know, depending on who you're reaching, like a well-crafted cold email can, can still do well, but you have to be super, super specific and short and sweet. Uh, and how you do it. And some people are more open to that than others. Um, so it just depends on on the person and yeah. and what they're going through at that moment. You know, but there's thing, never a bad time to try to reach out, yeah. is what One I would add was, um, you know, you might want to look for people who have um, you know, blogged or written about the, I the idea space that you're entering. That way, you know, someone's predisposed to like what you're doing. And, you know, say, hey, I, you know, I read this and this really sounds like something that I'm excited about, I'm working on, you know, we obviously have some, you know, things like that to try to create a connection are effective as well. Yeah, it's funny you said that. I was about to jump in and say, I always recommend to entrepreneurs who maybe don't have that, that the connections to VCs or the long, you know, history and track record, I tell them build a voice, right? And do that through blogging. You can you can do it. I've seen entrepreneurs and young VCs do it on Quora, um, do it on Reddit, um, have a voice, 
be out there in your topic area or the area of your startup and express your opinions um, and do it frequently and build a voice where people start to look to you. And that always is noted. When I was at Norwest, it was, you know, one of the things that could get around, well, there's not much history on this person. There's not a lot of track record. It's their first startup. They're right out of school. Um, if you find that they've got this great voice and they're writing things on Medium or Quora, um, and like you've said, Matt, I think that, that can get attention and show credibility and authority, which is important. Yeah, and also just for more junior people who are not, who are at, you know, at my level or something like that, um, just really well-crafted emails. It will shock you like how little homework people do before they reach out to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so really just by being super thorough and personal and honestly having an authentic reason to reach out for someone like me goes a, a really long way. Great. Uh, this question is from Ron Fisher. Hi, Ron. Um, Ron's asking, um, what new services, products, or traditions have you seen your portfolio companies take on as a result of this extended quarantine to stay better connected and work more efficiently? You seen anything emerge that's, that's really interesting and noteworthy on the way your teams are communicating with each other? and CEOs to the, to the employees? I, I have not. I mean, it's, it's all the stuff we all know about. You know, it's, uh, it's the more Zooms and, and um, you know, the Zoom happy hours. Was, you know, I, I have not seen systematically somebody implement something that was novel or like, wow, that's amazing. So. I would love to hear more ideas um, as they emerge around that. I think that phase one was just like, all right, this is our new norm. It's just like all the school and colleges moving their stuff online. It's like, okay, well, this is better than nothing. But clearly, if they had to do it for another semester, they'd have to change something to make it better, more dynamic, more interesting for group learning. So I think that's going to start to emerge. But as of now, I haven't, I think we're all a little disappointed we haven't seen more cooler ideas around that. One of the interesting things that some of, some of our founders have said is that they actually are working more efficiently with like a reduced team. Um, and I think part of that is like they have a tighter core group of people um, and they're doing more intense communication with those people. But I also think that this is forcing people, like you said, to really figure out what their strategy is and coalesce around that. Um, so not really a tactic, but just kind of a overarching Thing that I've seen. Yeah. And I've seen in some of my companies um, things that you might not think of as effective management techniques, but more around kind of that culture building. So I've seen kind of the, the, the virtual happy hours that, that happen online within a company take the place of the Thursday or Friday beer bash or the, you know, drinks out in the city. Um, so that is happening. And I think it's, it's proving interesting to to teams to kind of see each other in your environment, maybe with a baby on your lap or a new puppy, yeah. whatever right. it is that we're all seeing. And that actually can help strengthen, you know, the feeling of connection and we're all in this together. Um, and so I've seen, you know, that kind of thing. And it may be worth pointing out, um, there's a, a Tufts entrepreneur who's running a, a company, a, a, an ice cream company, Double Rainbow Ice Cream here in San Francisco super premium ice cream company. And they did something I think really smart. They've approached uh, other companies and gone to VCs and had them pass the word to, the, uh, to their entrepreneurs that Double Rainbow can have a delivered ice cream party virtually among your employees. And they literally bring in freeze, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Um, dry ice packed ice cream to everyone's home you know, dropped on the doorstep kind of semi-simultaneously for like a, a Friday afternoon kind of ice cream bash. And it's really clever yeah. and the Tufts entrepreneur running that, um, uh, Taryn Siegel. And I really thought it was not just a clever thing to do to, to bring business back for her company, a uh, long time family run business, but also to kind of, you know, help other companies kind of bond around something like ice cream that is thought of as being impossible these days. Yeah. yeah, sending any sort of physical products to people's houses is really well received right now. Yeah. yeah. Mm. 
Uh, our question from John Cheatwood. Uh, John asks, how are companies considering selling the government public sector today? Specifically those who might have been hesitant to do B to G sales before COVID-19. And this is going to be our last question before, before we close. I, you know, I wouldn't say I've seen a company suddenly say like, oh, I'm going to start selling to government. I, I think if you're selling to government, you're relieved that they're probably a good customer because the government's going to continue to spend from a stimulus standpoint. So if you were already successful selling to government, instead of hiring your next enterprise rep, you're probably going to hire another government rep and see how far that takes you until things uh, normalize a bit. I'm probably less likely to say we're not going to pay you. Um, I actually, I've seen less around like pivoting to selling to government. And the actual interesting thing has been um, like some of our satellite companies have been teaming up with people who they would never team up with usually to sell to government to basically like take on contracts. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been kind of an interesting opportunity um, of like people you wouldn't normally do business with. Great. Well, thank you for taking questions from the audience. Apologies to many of these questions we weren't able to get to, uh, but we'll see if, um, if Josh and Iggy have a way to follow up um, and, and maybe distribute some answers to some of these questions to, to the group. All right. Yeah. Um, so just I'm wanted to, to wrap up here. Um, firstly, thank you again to our panelists, Laurel and Matt, for your candid uh, and, and elaborate answers, you know, for, for really diving deep in a lot of these questions that our community has. Uh, thank you, Josh Goldman, for leading an engaging q and I'm impressed how many questions we, we got to, and I know there were some great others left over. Uh, Josh Kaufman and Shelby Schultz, who are working behind the scenes on the Q&A, and our co-organizers at the Office of Alumni Relations. Sorry, that's my dog reminding me that I have to walk her now. Um, the tech team got tough to put this together, and most of all, again, to, to you, to our attendees, for your questions and attention. Uh, this presentation was recorded, uh, so we'll be sharing the link uh, once it's up with all registered attendees. Though, of course, we want to be cautious and not scoop Matt's workbench announcement here. So we'll make, we'll make sure to keep that uh, breaking news for you. Right. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Josh Kaplan in one second from, uh, from the TEC Advisory Board. Uh, before I do, I'd just like to invite you to mark your calendars for our next two events. Uh, on May 19th, we're going to be hearing from Jumbos about the future of consumer retail and fashion obviously a hard hit industry with a lot of changes going on. And then on June 5th, we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna invite you to tune in to hear from recent winners of the Tufts 100K New Ventures competition about how they're growing their companies uh, since their victory during COVID, sorry, June 2nd on that one. Um, and we'll be doing these events uh, every two weeks or so. So please keep an eye out uh, on your emails. Uh, you'll be hearing from myself, uh, someone uh, from Tufts or one of our other great co-hosts and organizers. Uh, thank you again, Laurel and Matt, and I'll hand it over to Josh Kaplan to wrap us up. Thank you, Iggy. You did a phenomenal job moderating and, and, and leading the group. On behalf of the Tufts Entrepreneurship Center, uh, I want to thank Team for this fantastic kickoff event. We're very excited to have them as part of the ecosystem and are very appreciative of our partners at the Office of Alumni Relations. Entrepreneurship is the largest minor at the School of Arts and Sciences, and I think a part of every alumnus's DNA. Uh, we would love to engage all of you and get you involved with the center, as well as with the alumni network and help plan and take part in events like this. Uh, please reach out to Iggy, Brittany, uh, or Shelby uh, to learn more. And of course, I'm always available as well. Thank you all. Great, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.